air quality and animal agriculture. Air quality concerns have evolved in step with the livestock industry. While odors may dominate neighborhood discussion, there's also concern gases emitted from modern animal agriculture are impacting human health and the environment overall. In this presentation, we'll outline those concerns and summarize key federal and state air quality regulations, including some guidance for local government on odor regulation. First, it's important to understand how air quality concerns are weighed in public discourse. Some air pollutants are considered global or regional issues, while others dominate local concerns. For example, ammonia emitted from livestock operations is primarily a regional concern because it may contribute to atmospheric haze and impact the landscape as it falls to earth, causing soils to become more acidic. Globally, nitrous oxide and methane are classified as greenhouse gases. At the local scale, odorous gases tend to dominate discussion. Global concerns are typically regulated at a federal level, while local concerns are dealt with at the state, county, or township level. To better understand what air quality regulations mean, let's have a look at some basic definitions and concepts used to help determine what is or isn't acceptable under law. Concentrations measure how much of a particular pollutant can be found in a relative amount of air, commonly in parts per billion or parts per million. Milligrams per liter will quantify a pollutant's mass in a static volume, or liter in this case. Other pollutants are regulated on emission levels, or how much is released over a period of time, such as pounds per day or tons per year. To accurately measure emission levels, both the concentration and volume of exhaust air must be known. Emissions is the product of these two values. National ambient air quality standards form the basis for most current air pollution regulations. Six criteria pollutants were identified with primary and secondary standards designed to protect both the health of sensitive populations and protect public welfare including protection against decreased visibility, damage to animals, crops, vegetation, and buildings, they impose both a concentration limit and duration or time of exposure. Along with the six pollutants under ambient air quality standards, 188 hazardous air pollutants or air toxics are also identified. These pollutants are known or suspected to cause cancer or other serious health effects, such as reproductive effects or birth defects or adverse environmental effects. Of the main pollutants from animal feeding operations listed on slide 3 of this presentation, only particulate matter is included in national ambient air quality standards. Although not listed specifically in national ambient air quality standards, Confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, must report any air pollutant emissions higher than 100 pounds per day. This is required under the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. This requirement includes reporting hydrogen sulfide and ammonia emissions. As is the case with much of the Clean Air Act, authority to enforce these standards is delegated to individual states' environmental regulatory agencies. In Minnesota, this reporting is done through the duty officer or by contacting the Minnesota EPCRA program. Additionally, VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, fall under some federal regulations because of their role in the formation of ozone. Inventory requirements are in place for ammonia because it can help form small particulate matter, contributing to atmospheric haze. Haze is primarily a concern in some parts of California and other western states where mountainous terrain surrounds heavily populated areas. This, and the atmospheric phenomenon known as air inversion, will allow warm air aloft to trap denser cool air near the ground surface. This cap keeps pollutants from escaping these areas via natural convection, and the result is haze. Regardless, all states are responsible for developing state implementation plans to meet federal air quality standards. In addition to federal standards, Minnesota has ambient air quality standards for hydrogen sulfide at property lines. These are concentration limits no more than 30 parts per billion, averaged over a half hour more than twice in any five-day period, 
or more than 50 parts per billion, averaged over the same time period twice a year. Farmers are allowed up to 21 days a year to exceed these limits when pumping and agitating manure during land application. This exemption only applies if the farmer or manure applicator first notifies the county feedlot officer or the MPCA. The Minnesota permitting process for CAFOs includes requirements for meeting air quality standards. The State Feedlot Rule, Chapter 7020, requires CAFOs to identify emission sources on the farm. They must then either devise emission reduction strategies or model the site's potential emissions to help ensure compliance with hydrogen sulfide standards and Minnesota health risk values for ammonia. Odor emissions and related nuisance issues, along with dust emissions, are also addressed in Chapter 7020. Despite state and federal attention to air impacts from CAFOs, the most prevalent issue at the local regulatory scale, and one not addressed by federal or state regulations, continues to be odor from all sizes of livestock operations. Perception of odor is very subjective. This, combined with the very real impacts of odor on quality of life, make it very difficult to regulate. Traditional means of regulation are generally prescriptive, performance-based, or a combination of both. Prescriptive practices are the easiest to enforce because they prescribe or mandate specific conditions, including operational practices, setback distances, or emission control technologies, such as biofiltration or manure storage covers. Properly operated and maintained, the facility is in compliance if these conditions are followed. Enforcement simply requires a site visit to verify that the practice is installed and working or that setback distances have been met. Although easy to enforce, prescriptive regulations won't always produce the desired result. Even when followed to the letter, facilities with required practices in place can still be a source of community odors. At the same time, blanket regulations may not be necessary, as certain topographical features or facility designs may already limit community impacts. For example, buildings with biofilters will reduce odors despite the potential for the same farm to have other larger odor sources that can impact those downwind but requirements for covers on open air manure storage located in remote areas are only a hardship for the producer since any neighborhood impact would be minimal without a cover prescriptive practices can also limit development and adoption of newer more efficient technologies unless provisions for the use of experimental technologies are written into the local code or ordinance Performance-based regulatory approaches offer flexibility in facility design or emission control since the only concern regards emission limits or downwind impact. Established ambient concentrations or site emission limits requires concern from regulators only if the site fails to meet those limits. Minnesota's hydrogen sulfide standard is a good example of a performance-based regulation. Water quality discharge standards are another good example of performance-based regulations since these set prescribed standards for the concentration or load leaving a facility rather than mandate how wastewater is treated prior to discharge. Enforcement of performance-based regulations must be done through compliance monitoring. Unfortunately, ambient air quality monitoring is both difficult and expensive. Verification of air emission-based compliance from farms is also a challenge, as there are often many emitting sources on the farm that would require monitoring. Computer modeling offers a third regulatory approach that has some distinct advantages over prescriptive and performance standards. Information specific to a particular farm layout or design, along with historic weather data, can be used to predict downwind concentrations and document the likelihood of compliance with performance-based standards. It's also cheaper than monitoring and can be very useful when new facilities are proposed. Unfortunately, computer models are only as good as available information. At this time, accurate emission data or the effectiveness of control technologies is not available for many types of emitting sources. In addition, most computer models have not been well validated for predicting downwind concentrations from farm sites at distances similar to property lines and nearby neighbors. 
Still, even with limited data, computer models have been shown to provide reasonable estimates of site emissions and their downwind impacts. Offset is a computer-based modeling tool used in recent years that helps predict downwind odor impacts from livestock operations. At its core is published data on site emissions of odor and hydrogen sulfide and a simple algorithm based on standard air dispersion models using Minnesota weather data. Offset has been validated with field data and its use in several communities over the past 10 years has shown it to be a reliable predictor of odor nuisance issues. Offset estimates a distance and time period when odor downwind of a facility will not be annoying to nearby residents. Annoyance-free time is not when ambient odors are zero, but rather when odors are at levels not typically considered annoying. While annoyance varies from person to person, Offset research included both citizens who live near livestock facilities and trained staff to come up with the best average account of what would be considered annoying to the majority of the population. The research also reveals some who may never find odors annoying and some whose tolerance for any odor beyond fresh air is a definite distraction to everyday life. Again, Offset does its best to account for the majority of what's considered an annoyance to the population. To find the desired annoyance-free distance, Offset requires the input of type and size of all the odor sources on the farm and any emission control technologies in use or proposed. Several counties in Minnesota have odor regulations that include Offset estimates. Regulations based on Offset or other available models require an established limit considered the best balance between farm and non-farm residents' right to quality of life and the ability to make a living. Often these limits are different in rural and urban locations. The latest version of Offset also includes hydrogen sulfide and ammonia emission estimates and reports them in pounds per day and tons per year. This feature was added to help farmers determine compliance with the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act reporting requirements discussed earlier in this presentation. Here's a simple example of how offset works. A swine finishing site has a capacity of 2,000 head housed in two 40 by 200 foot barns. The distance to the nearest neighbor from the edge of the barn is 1,000 feet. This information is plugged into the model via drop-down menus. Identical barns can be listed in the same cell. Offset will account for the additional odors accordingly. Bear in mind that two similar barns won't always mean twice the downwind smell. No emission control technologies are implemented at this site, so the control technology column is left blank. Emitting sources are categorized by building or area sources. Building sources are covered structures, while area sources are open-air feedlots and manure storage structures. The odor annoyance-free frequency is shown in the upper right. Detailed model results are found on the Results tab of the spreadsheet. Details include a summary of site information with average and maximum hydrogen sulfide and ammonia emissions in pounds per day. There's also a graphical representation of the odor frequency as one goes farther from the site. Offset is easy to use and provides a quick method of evaluating odor impacts from a farm site. A common question with offset regards missing barn types. These tend to be new building designs not yet put into the model. An example is cross-ventilated dairy barns. They're becoming more popular, but are not listed in offset's drop-down source menu because there's been no qualified emission data from these types of barns. In this case, there are two options. The first is to model the unlisted source as a similar source, such as substituting a dairy freestall barn in place of the cross-ventilated type. If valid data is available on emissions from a new source, it can be added to the model. Near the bottom of the input page, there are cells designed for adding new types of building or area sources. Simply add the name of the source type and corresponding emission data. It's also a good idea to document the source of the data. After this, the source type will show up in the drop-down menu. This can also be done for new emission control technologies. Simply list the technology and claimed reduction benefits in the cells provided. This technology will then appear in the Emission Control drop-down menu. 
Despite its simplicity, offset has been used successfully for predicting the odor impact from animal feeding operations. More information on offset, odor, and air quality is available at the Manure Management and Air Quality website at the University of Minnesota. Here you'll find the original fact sheet on offset and a version of the spreadsheet you can download for free. Thank you for your interest in air quality. More information on this increasingly important topic is available at the websites you see here.